Let me welcome you all to this uh, webinar. Um, so, some of you are joining us uh, from the United States, others from Europe, from India, and typically our viewership for these webinars goes as far as Singapore and not Hong Kong because everyone is asleep in Hong Kong at this time. Um, Ram, I'm Ashutosh Varshne, director of the Center for Contemporary South Asia here at Brown. And it's a pleasure to host this event. Ram Guha's prolific writing career has a new edition, Re Rebels Against the Raj, Western Fighters for India's Freedom, published by Alfred Knopf here in the US, uh, I think a month ago. <clears throat> It chronicles the story of seven remarkable people who fought on behalf of India against British rule, four from Britain, two from the United States, and one from Ireland. Four were men and three were women. These seven, Ram Guha's chosen seven, do not remarkably include the famous Anglican, Anglican priest, Charlie Andrews, who built bridges between the Raj and the freedom movement, especially Mahatma Gandhi. They also do not include Dalrymple's white Mughals, who came to India from foreign lands, but sought Mughal luxury. All seven, to quote him, endured poverty and hardship, disease and incarceration, unquote. They sought ordinary lives. They embraced imprisonment also. Ram Guha is a historian and a biographer based in Bangalore, and he's joining us from there. Among his many books are, I will just note my favorites, The Unquiet Woods, India After Gandhi, and the two-volume biography of Mahatma Gandhi. Engaging him in a conversation about the new book is my colleague, Leela Gandhi, also on the screen, a literary and cultural theorist and the John Hawkes Professor of Humanities and English here at Brown, and also currently the director of our Pembroke Center. The Common Cause is among her latest books where in which she, she examines the lives of those dissenters in Britain in the first half of the 20th century who, to quote Amanda Anderson, a colleague of ours, lived ordinary lives, making themselves less rather than more, making themselves re less rather than more. So we have a, a scholar of self-reduction, perhaps self-deprivation in Britain, who will have a conversation with a scholar of self-deprivation in British India. That's how this is set up. The format is as follows. Leela will introduce the book beyond what I have said briefly. Then the conversation with Ram will proceed around nine to 10 topics that Leela has chosen. And then we'll follow up with Q&A. And your questions should come via chat, which I'll be monitoring. So before, uh, so, um, and, I, and I'll try to include as many questions from the chat as possible. Of course, the, 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 the webinar will end at 11.30 Eastern Standard Time in the United States. So we have an hour and a half to, to discuss and to ask questions of uh, Ram. Um, um, I will go off the video now and hand you over to Leela. Leela. <clears throat> Thank you uh, so much, uh, Ashu. Uh, um, I, uh, um, just a few prefatory words, uh, uh, adding to your, your description. It's absolutely my incredible privilege um, uh, to join this conversation with Ram Chandra Guha on, on the topic of his uh, uh, amazing new book, uh, Rebels Against the Raj. I, I have said, this to him, I literally couldn't put it down. It's a, a masterpiece of intricately plotted narrative history and historical biography, and yet another work that augments um, Ram Guha's unparalleled, textured, uh, evolving portrait of uh, colonial and post-colonial South 
Asia. Um, um, uh, just a few minutes to add a, a little more to Ashu's uh, beautiful introduction. This, this book, uh, a group uh, biography, though so much more uh, than that, of seven individuals, some better known than others, um, Annie Besant, uh, uh, B.G. Horneman, Samuel, later Satyanand Stokes, Madeleine Slade, later Mira Ben, uh, Philip Spratt, uh, um, Richard Ralph Keaton, and Catherine Mary Heilman, later Sarla Ben. Um, four of these characters are British, two American, one Irish, four men, three women, some married, some single, and at least one of them, Ram suggests, is uh, queer or gay. Uh, these um, intersecting lives um, and the, the, the timeline of this book is exquisite. Um, it spans nearly a century um, and uh, uh, the, the, it's bookended, at least to my mind, uh, by two notable events, uh, the 1893 Chicago World Parliament of Religions, uh, on the one side famous for uh, Vivekanan's speech about religious tolerance and ecumenism, and on the other, the 1975 Indian State of Emergency, called by the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Of this event, Ram has, uh, has said memorably in an essay he published in the Hindu some 20 years ago, I think, uh, Indian democracy took an extended leave of absence. Uh, um, though all of the seven uh, lives in this book are, are different and distinct, all the characters are by, by uh, Ram Guha's account in some way magnetized by Gandhi. Um, and uh, all of them arrived in India to join um, the anti-colonial struggle against the British colonial regime as rebels against the Raj. So um, to begin uh, 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 Ram, um, this, um, this troop of rebelling against one's own culture for the sake of another, at the heart of your book is of course extremely salient now as we watch courageous Russian protesters against Putin's war on Ukraine. You're very precise about what such rebellion entails. Um, you say bridge building isn't enough, temporary solidarity isn't enough. All your characters make a, a home of India. Um, and, you know, it, they recall uh, a very uh, Elvin from your exquisite 1999 uh, book, Savaging the uh, Civilized, though he doesn't make this list either. So what draws you so much to this process of throwing over the world in which one is born for uh, a world one has found? Uh, I mean, of, of growing, going native in that discredited uh, term. Yes. So Lila, uh, you mentioned my biography of Elvin. And this book actually has its genesis in that biography, because it was while working on Elwin that I got fascinated and intrigued by this phenomenon of Western men and women uh, coming over to India and making a home here and taking different routes, some spiritual, some social, some, some political, some technological, and immersing them, themselves in Indian life. And that phenomenon, which I call the other side of the Raj, which you've also written about in your, in your writings, uh, has intrigued and fascinated me. But when I wanted to, uh, in a sense, focus the book, I thought rather than this be a, too diffuse, rather than it go all over the place, become a general kind of anecdotal history of encounters of many Westerners with India, let me introduce a boundary condition huh. that they should be arrested or deported. <laughs> and in a sense, uh, this was also linked to my work on Elwin Leela because one of Elwin's abiding regrets was that he was never arrested. Unlike his friend Miraben, Madeline Slade, uh, you know, to whom he was very close, he felt envious of her for having gone to prison along with Gandhi in the freedom movement. So it was just a way of sharpening the focus, uh, you know, and making the project manageable. And also, I should say, it's not completely exhaustive. In uh, the seven characters, as you mentioned, whom I profile in this book, there are four who appear in the epilogue uh, as uh, getting an honorable mention because I wasn't able to get enough new rich material on them. Uh, and I think, uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the, the historical arc, 1893 to the 1970s, because it's a century of tumultuous, complicated history uh, in which these lives uh, make their mark, uh, starting with uh, 
you know, the year that actually not uh, Vivekananda goes to uh, Chicago and Gandhi goes to Durban. In that year, Annie Besant uh, arrives, uh, arrives in Madras right up till times I myself remember. And of course, I didn't, didn't know any of these people, but several of them were active while I was a college student during the emergency and after Sarla Devi uh, was uh, someone who inspired the Chipko movement in the 70s and the 80s. So it's a kind of a century long arc through which, uh, and these lives are a prism through which one can map, understand, interpret, reflect on Indian history through this century. Huh. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ram. I, I very much like the idea of a, a boundary condition. I hope later we can talk about your, your writing process because this is such a writerly book as, as your writings tend to be. Um, so if I could just talk about a couple of these boundary, uh, throw you out on a couple of these boundary conditions. You mentioned, um, uh, incarceration, and, and so did Ashu in his introduction. It's a very important factor, uh, um, uh, a prerequisite for the uh, for the rebellion that makes it into your book. Um, all of your characters, pretty much without exception, spent significant amount of time in colonial prisons. And as you tell this story, I, I was struck by the the realization of just how how chronic the threat of incarceration is in a colonial regime, that you know, uh, your characters are constantly being deported, they are, their volition and will is constantly being arrested, literally. Yes, um, yes. So uh, such regimes are arguably in a way, I, I just realized, you know, cultures of emergency. Uh, yeah. At the same time, uh, you know, prison and jail time is not just a, a, a negative thing in this book, you know, because um, it's a crucible for Gandhian politics. I mean, of course, um, Gandhi has so much to say about the ideal prisoner who must transform the jail authorities. Um, Elwin, uh, uh, inspired by this sort of momentum, you know, regrets not going to prison. So it's a very complex, it's a very complex account about incarceration. I, I'd love to draw you out on it. Yeah, so uh, uh, several were incarcerated for long periods. Mira Ben most of all, you know, because uh, mm -hmm. she uh, is the closest to Gandhi and she's imprisoned in the Salt March in 1930s. She's alone, she's away from Gandhi. And then, of course, a much longer period of incarceration in the Aga Khan Palace, which is Gandhi's last period in prison, in either a South African or a British prison. Um, uh, almost two years in which, of course, Gandhi's beloved secretary, Mahadev Desai, and his wife of 60 years, Kasurba, died. Uh, so that's a kind of, so in a sense, Meera is sharing her, uh, her feeling of being stifled and uh, confined in a jail with the person she'd most like to be, which is Gandhi, most, <laughs> most of the time. But, but the others are kind of all over the place. You know, Stokes is in Lahore, and he writes, um, and Stokes lived in Himachal. Uh, which up beyond the Shimla Hills uh, in a taluk called Kodgan at about 7,000 feet with a kind of alpine uh, climate. And here he is in Lahore jail in the summer with mosquitoes, you know, really upset about it, but somehow soldiering through. Uh, Sarla Ben, uh, who was also in the hills in Uttarakhand, is sent out of spite to a jail in the plains. Wow. A first, a first uh, it's in a hill jail, which is bearable. And the English magistrate says, how dare an English woman rebel against the Raj? I'm going to send you to Lucknow so that you suffer more. So I think it's, uh, you know, of course, uh, 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 you know, this kind of vindictiveness is not unknown in post-colonial regimes either, you know, whether in India or elsewhere. I mean, there's a famous story of the emergency where Indira Gandhi jailed Mahad Marani Gayatri Devi, a princess, and, and, and put her in the worst jail, actually near uh, some uh, prisoners with mental health conditions who would shriek all through the night, right? So sometimes when you have control over the levers of power and you really want to get after those you feel have, uh, whose protest has angered you the most, uh, you, you want to send them as you, as uh, Sarla Ben was sent to a prison in Lucknow rather than carrying on in Almora, which at least weather-wise would have been fine. So I think incarceration and deportation. So two of the people were deported, five were incarcerated for varying periods of time. Two were deported, Horniman and and uh, and uh, uh, Kaitan, and uh, who was sent back to America. And you know, in some ways, uh, Lila, I just wonder, in some ways deportation may be worse True. because 
you you arrested in india are uh, you exchange life in a village for life in a jail but you're still with the people you've identified with here in the case of honiman you see yourself as a man of bombay as an indian journalist editing an indian newspaper allied with the freedom struggle and you have to spend 7 years in exile and he's so desperate to come back you know the kind of petitions he gets signed by people like ag wells and george bernard shaw he goes on and on and finally uh, uh, he adopts a, a, a process of subterfuge and illegally lands up you know <laughs> on the madras coast and uh, the british can't then deport him and this is why i wonder about holiman obviously he was in love with mumbai he identified with the freedom struggle but was he in love with an indian you know i mean i think that's that may be part of his motivation likewise with ketan uh, who is in south india likes his work very much has made some close friends has mentored some remarkable social workers and then in during the quit india movement the british deport him back to a small town called merom in indiana and you know, it, it's only after independence that rajagopalachari you know encourages him to come back so in some ways exile for people like this exile may be more difficult you know for some indians today who are not allowed to come back to india you know because of their political views you know someone someone uh, just compared honiman in london uh, to atish tasir in new york for example <laughs> yeah. so some ways i i feel i'm mean, reflecting on this deportation may be emotionally harder physically easier obviously it's nicer to live in the midwest than in a crummy british colonial jail in somewhere in south india but uh, emotionally i think at least incarceration solidified confirmed consolidated their identification with india so they felt more indian by going to jail with indians but being picked up and put on a boat and saying to me go far away and we don't know when you'll come back may have been harder it's so true it's so true uh, and um i mean another another condition you know is uh you're so right and i also think about you know gandhi is never is never restricted that sort of freedom of movement between places you know he may have spent a lot of time in jail but he comes and goes from this country to that country all the time yeah. uh, so, so another um uh, 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 boundary condition for qualifying uh, for rebellion in the way you describe is much more than the acquisition of language and you know you have um, some of your characters don't uh, uh, speak local languages yes. um, right. but you emphasize i mean something that i can only call like a commitment to the transformation of the body uh, through uh, factors like uh, dress and diet and comportment you know samuel stoke there are all these iconic moments stokes sheds western robes for a uh, for that of a indian mendicant madeline slade learns to sit cross legged she tries various items of clothing settles on the agra um everyone you know adopts a kind of so i mean to what extent do, do you i mean it's such so attentive you're so attentive to these moments of of a biological uh, transformation to what extent did have you got this perspective from your intimate study of gandhi you know for whom uh, politics uh, transformation requires a kind of conversion of the body a conversion of, of course the... very much so and i think that's the ethos that uh, gandhi sets for himself and for people around him and people who are inspired by him and whether they know it or not uh, or stokes onwards adi besant is the uh, comes before gandhi she's older than gandhi but stokes onward the kind of um, cultural physiological sartorial transformation that these people undergo is really really inspired by gandhi you know and in some cases changing their names you know becoming satyanan right. becoming meera becoming sarla you know all of this is part of that process of uh, i don't like the word indigenization but uh, maybe identification you know transgression uh, and i think gandhi sets the tone uh, and it's interesting of course who stays apart you know i think uh, i mean your, your question is very interesting i'm, I'm just thinking uh, but who stays apart in this list of seven i think the two people who stay apart at least when it comes to dress and go <laughs> and at least superficial outward comportment leela are honeyman and spratt okay they both continue to wear western dress and i wonder whether that's because they are journalists and writers of an fierce independence of mind 
and don't want to be swayed completely by Gandhi. You know, I think it's, it's a mark of their, you could say, their self-reliance that they don't wear Indian dress. As independent minded writers and editors. I mean, I'm just, it's your question uh, that has sparked this reflection. And I wish I'd, we'd had this conversation before I wrote my book. I could have added a, added a couple of paragraphs on this. That Horniman and Spratt never remotely considered taking an Indian name or indeed uh, taking it to dress or indeed adopting vegetarian food habits. I mean, there's an anecdote <laughs> about Spratt which will amuse you because it's kind of linked uh, to your own family background, which is when Spratt moves to Madras uh, to join Rajagopalachari in Swarajya, he's allotted a flat in an in a, in a, in a, in a apartment called Kalki Gardens, named after a famous writer who was close to Rajaji, and essentially uh, a Tambran ghetto. And uh, <laughs> Spratt likes meat. Spratt <laughs> likes meat. And, you know, he's actually Spratt is married to a non brahmin He's married to a Chetiyar. So his wife and children also like meat. And there are these smells that waft across to the Spratt kitchen, to the surrounding Tamil Brahmin households. And there's some murmurs of protest. And then Spratt goes somewhere else and uh, <laughs> rents a house outside Kalki Gardens while continuing to work with Swarajya, editing Swarajya. So I think Spratt and Hollywood were, in a sense, not just rebels against the Raj. But uh, rebels against a Gandhian disciplinary ethos too, you know, in some ways. Yeah, and maybe as writers, I mean, writers tend to be independent and you know uh, can be captured, so to say. You know, true, true. And Horniman, you know, again in your amazing portrait, is a is a man of style. You know, yeah, yeah, he likes much. good life, and I think yeah. the Gandhian attire. He likes, of... ballet, he likes ballet. He likes art. He likes music. He likes to dress well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Ram. And of course, um, another question which was uh, uh, on my mind throughout as I read the book is, and you, you know, in a recent interview, I think you've mentioned that you were really pleased that three of your seven subjects were women, uh, and since your previous biological subjects have all been male. Now, these, these three, you know, Annie Besant, uh, though you've written of women uh, in these in these other studies, that, uh, you know, the sort of extreme sensitivity. But Annie Besson, Madeleine Slade, Slade, Mira, Catherine Heilman, Sarla Devi, I have many questions about this writing about women. Of course, one is what were you, the challenges and rewards for you as a biographer? And of course, the other is they're all really different women. Uh, and yeah. not all of them are gender progressive. I mean, Annie Besson certainly not, does not like women. Uh, yeah. Sarla Devi is amazing. Campaigns for women in the Uttar Khand Himalaya, you say extremely conservative place when it comes to the rights of women. Meera is just such a, a, a wonderful biography, Ram. You portray her so sensitively as someone who struggles with her own sexuality, you know, from being a diehard celibate. She scolds Devdas Gandhi for falling in love with yes. Rajgopalachari's yes. daughter Lakshmi. Yes. Um, yes. And then she falls into unrequited love with an Indian man and Bapu is her confidant. I mean, so, so just, just to start there. So I think, uh, Lila, this was certainly for me new and exciting and challenging to write about uh, women, in a sense, as independent subjects. I mean, women are featured in my other books, but they've been secondary. You know, Elvin's Two Wives, Gandhi, Kasturba, uh, Gandhi's secretary, remarkable secretary in South Africa, Sonia Schlesing, but they've never been really fleshed out. And they've been written about, even if you're, you're kind to say I wrote about them with sympathy and understanding, but even if I, some, of, some of that is there, they're always uh, secondary to the main character whom they are associated with and often serve. And I really enjoyed writing about these three women because I'd never actually remotely done anything of this kind before. You know, even in my early work on peasants, it's mostly male peasant protesters whose traces are in the archive. It is very rare to find uh, women uh, in the, you know, in the conservative peasant societies leave their track traces in the colonial archive for the historian to discover. So, and they were all very different. I think all, uh, I mean, Annie Besant was a force of nature. You know, she was uh, amazing, absolutely full of certitude about mm -hmm. an extraordinary energy, constantly reinventing herself. But at the age of, you know, in the 60s, uh, late 60s, uh, to abandon theosophy and start a home rule movement. I mean, that kind of certitude is required you know, for activists uh, often. Mira, as you uh, uh, and 
I think Satra in some ways is the most um, endearing because uh, you mentioned earlier on that not all my subjects learned Indian languages adequately, but Satra did. I mean, she, she spoke Hindi. And uh, as I say, you know, there's a story of how she stumbles on the hillside and she says, Baap re Baap. He doesn't say, oh my God. Instinctively, <laughs> 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 distinctively. And she writes her books in Hindi and then she writes in Hindi and then translates it herself into English, you know. So, and, and nurturing these women uh, activists in the most backward patriarchal part of India. In fact, uh, one of the happiest moments in uh, my research was to go to Kosani when she set up the ashram and uh, talked to Radha Bhen, who was her, uh, her successor, who joined the ashram as a 16 year old and is now 88 and still very active actually in social and public causes. The first woman to be head of the Gandhi Peace Foundation among other things. You know, so that was, a, in fact, I, I suppose in some ways I'm an old school biographer in that I don't put my research journeys into the book, you know, but some of the things, so, but going to Kosani, or going to the uh, Christian hospital where Kaitan died and discovering his papers in, in a cupboard were also part of the excitement. Oh my but God. I, th I think Sarla Ben going to Kosani, because Kosani is also a place where Gandhi revised his commentary on the Gita in 1929. So it has a place in Gandhian law too. And it's a beautiful place, Leela. If you've not been or anyone, anyone listening uh, uh, to, uh, to this conversation, Kosani has the best views of the snows in the Uttarakhand Himal. Wow. Absolutely the best views of the snows. Uh, it's also the hometown of the great Hindi poet Subhutra Nandan Pant, many of whose poems are about actually slow cat mountains. Mm -hmm. And uh, on top of this hill is this women's school which Sarla Devi set up in 1946, which is still active. And it's wonderful to go there and see these young kids, you know, learning, listening, singing, playing, spinning, farming, and so on and so forth. So the her spirit is still alive. You know, I think. Several of these people, their legacies endure. You know, I think uh, some, of course, have been. Stokes is certainly well remembered in in, in Himachal. His uh, promotion of uh, apple cultivation sustains the economy of Himachal. Still, some have disappeared. I think Honeyman, by the way, just I'll just end with this. Honeyman sadly is largely forgotten in his native Bombay. Because there's a circle named after him, which is uh, in South Bombay. It's a beautiful circle. Uh, opposite the Asiatic Society with some nice Gothic buildings around it and lots of trees in the park. But two Mumbaikars uh, in their 70s, distinguished Mumbaikars, one a retired judge and one a, re a writer, a journalist, read my book and said they always thought Horniman was a Parsi. <laughs> Nariman, Horniman and half the things <laughs> of Mumbai are named after Parsi. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, and they were gobsmacked to find he was this radical, freewheeling, possibly gay journalist. So some of them, I think, uh, have been unjustly forgotten. Others like Annie Besant live on in the institutions they founded. Uh, 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 Ram, so just, just to stay with this question of gender, I mean, of course, all, all of these three women uh, enjoyed surprising freedoms and privileges. Now, those are, of course, a function of race and class. The main sahab is an intractable figure in colonial yes, yes. post-colonial India. But yes. how much of, in a micro level, how much of the kind of freedom they took for granted had to do with their um, access to, uh, to the way in which Gandhi thought of women? You know, uh, they were all, of, I mean, you know, I mean, Mira is very close to Gandhi and I'm just interested in what he made available to his women associates. I mean, by way of a kind of a standard to which gender norms are impertinent in some way, his own gender fluidity. There's yeah. something exceptional there that, you know, you, you've thought about for a very long time. Um, so I absolutely, I think Gandhi, uh, I mean, Gandhi is someone whom, uh, uh, you know, superficially, of course, a feminist would not warm, warm to Gandhi. He's ambivalent about uh, women in the workplace. He has bizarre ideas about celibacy and sex. But in other ways, historically, he's enabling. You know, he, women come into public life, into activism, into building institutions. A lot, Indian women, a lot because of Gandhi. Uh, I think, yet having said that, I think 
a certain distance from Gandhi, which Sarla enjoyed huh. in contrast to Meera, was probably huh. enabling and really? emancipatory for, for Sarla. I think Meera was just too close to Gandhi. You know, I think uh, she had a, a deep and intense engagement with Gandhi. And uh, in her dealings with Indians, uh, male or female, she could be somewhat hierarchical. Uh, you know, she, because she was so close to Gandhi, uh, when she established her own ashram, young men came to work with her, but they came to serve her. Uh -huh. Whereas those who worked with Sarla were really co-workers, collaborators, colleagues. Uh, and I think there was this, uh, uh, I think uh, some of Gandhi's magnetism uh, reflected on to Meera because she'd been so close to Gandhi. Mm -hmm. And she, except for, interestingly, except for Devdas Gandhi, who in a sense is a kind of, um, uh, you know, it's controversial to say this, but I see them actually like siblings. I mean, Gandhi never had a daughter and Devdas and Meera were actually in a sense, not friends, of course, but also kind of a brother sister kind of relationship, sort of. And actually she didn't really have Indian friends. And that may have been partly because she was so obsessed with Gandhi and partly mm -hmm. because when she came to start her own ashram and had Indians working with her, they all were kind of deferential towards her. Adi Besant even more so. You talk about Memsa. Adi Besant was called Badi Memsa in North <laughs> India. <laughs> and in South India, she was called Peri Amma, which is, you know, like, you know, big, big mother, right? No. Yeah. So I think Sarla in some ways was able to realize her independence, her um, forge her own path and her career uh, 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 most substantively, possibly because she came last and the others had prepared the way. You know, that also sometimes is the case that, uh, you know, the, the people who battled before you uh, can't really... Uh, directly challenge patriarchy or prejudice. It's true of the Dalit movement too, you know. I mean, Ambedkar had to come after Gandhi and had to be more direct and more confrontational and more radical than Gandhi, not just because he was a Dalit himself, but because he also came after, you know, some of the paths had been opened for him. Uh, yeah, so it's, a, it's a, but I was, as I said, it was a real, uh, I'm so glad I wrote this book partly because I could write about these three women, you know, and flesh them out. Mira, I think, uh, Leela, is purely because of uh, her pivotal role in the freedom struggle. And also afterwards in actually enabling Attenborough's film, uh, probably deserves a biography in herself. Yes, that's- I mean, I think what I, I've not really, I mean, I think a full standalone biography by a younger uh, biographer with more energy than me and more insights into some of the questions you've raised would be great, possibly even a film. Uh, called Bapu Ki Beti. <laughs> True. <laughs> it's all the rebellion too that goes into yes, the relationship. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't realized the role she played in Attenborough's film. It's a remarkable story. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, Ram. Um, on, a, on another note, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of um, uh, great profundity on this topic uh, uh, um, in the book is that you highlight throughout the book um, how almost all your subjects um, partake of something that you describe and is clearly a kind of spiritual politics, you know. Uh, yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, there are many features of this. Uh, one is, uh, you know, having a non instrumental relationship to people and things. The other is um, this belief that working on yourself in this particular intricate way will make you less parochial, you know, more um, a, a custodian of the world. Um, I, um, you know, you write um, uh, to, uh, a sense of values to be pursued regardless of an individual's background of theater of enactment and a beautiful phrase. What in your view is the difference between this sort of signatory spiritual politics and the sort of religious politics that we have in contemporary India? Yeah, I think, uh, again, uh, it's uh, inescapable and uh, um, almost mandatory that we turn to Gandhi. Because Gandhi was spiritual without being religious in a certain sense. You know, he was not confined by orthodoxy, by customary practice, um, by what what kind of Hindu was Gandhi? You know, he was his own kind of Hindu. Right? You know, he was no, uh, he couldn't be slotted into a sect. 
you know, Ram lived inside his heart. He didn't need a temple for Ram. His Ram was also called Allah. Uh, his closest friend was a Christian priest. You know, uh, so I think, uh, and yet he was a profoundly spiritual person uh, who had room uh, late in life also for engagement with atheists. Well, again, one of my favorite and uh, contributions to the literature on Gandhiana uh, is a little tract uh, by a follower of Gandhi called Gora, G. Ramchandra Rao, called an atheist with Gandhi. Mm -hmm. uh, Gora was followed Gandhi in, um, uh, you know, he started an ashram in near Vijayawada where he women he brought women uh, promoted women's education worked to abolish untouchability uh, you know promoted khadi but would not worship said i'm an atheist and then gandhi called him and they had this conversation and as part of these conversations was actually uh, gandhi's reversal of his of his dictum god is truth to truth is god you know so it was inverted, <laughs> kind of to incorporate even an atheist point of view so i think what you say Leela, i mean you know kind of a this kind of sense that uh, the world is greater than us, than me, you know, the world is greater than me, that the way to truth and, uh, uh, you know, whatever, you know, a desirable life is through interpersonal relations, through service, through understanding. In that sense, there is something spiritual about it. And several of them, of course, come from a spiritual background, you know, Stokes and, uh, Stokes and um, uh, Ketana missionaries who leave the church but don't reject uh, completely their, their Christian past. I mean, even when Stokes becomes a Hindu, he thinks of it as a fulfillment of his path rather than a rejection of what he did before. But I think Gandhi opened the way for this kind of um, uh, engagement with uh, you know, spirituality and faith uh, while rejecting dogma and certitude. I think one of Gandhi's greatest inventions was the interfaith prayer meeting. You know, right. uh, I think that's, that, that, that is something which uh, now it's uh, not without knowing that it comes from Gandhi Lila, you will find it practiced in the West. You know, you'll find a church in New York uh, having Jewish rabbis and Hindu monks coming and speak from the pulpit occasionally. But for Gandhi, of course, it was a daily business morning and evening and interfaith prayer meeting. And I think, in a sense, all these people, I don't think any of them. Sprat may have been a bit of a skeptic. He may have been a bit of an atheist. I can't really say. But the others, I think, again, this is really part of the ethos of the times, which is opposed to, uh, you know, strict demarcation, uh, is opposed to looking at things in terms of conflict, opposition, Hindu versus Muslim, uh, India versus the West. All those oppositions somehow are, are diluted, and in some cases even, even uh, just, you know, rejected. Right, right, right. So, I mean, you know, that's the kind of one of the capacious ideals that you document throughout the book. And again, I think the Chicago Parliament of Religion stands over it, you know, iconically. Uh, um, ecumenism, uh, um, a kind of um, uh, capaciousness of conscience. Um, when did all of this go out of vogue? I mean, is it possible to put a date to it? Because is it the last decade or so, or so of contemporary? I think, I, I think, Lila, I think social media has quite a lot to do with it. Huh. How so? And, uh, uh, because it, on, when you're in social media, you en only engage virtually with people who confirm your prejudices. Interesting. You know, the Trumpians are talking to the Trumpians. Uh, you know, the Bernie Sanders uh, followers mm. are talking to the Bernie Sanders <laughs> followers, you know, you, know, you know, and so on and so forth. Hindutva folks are talking among themselves. <coughs> and there's a kind of a self-selection in whom you follow, whom you engage with. Uh, and it's not just serendipitous encounters. You know, you're traveling on a train and you're meeting someone of a different background. You start a conversation. When your conversations are on your phone, uh, you know, I think it, it orients you in a kind of a... Uh, uh, it's, it puts you in silos. I mean, this is just my hunch that social media may have conversation and dialogue, which is what uh, Gandhi practiced all his life, right? And uh, there's an old, um, uh, uh, old and still useful book on Gandhi by David Hardiman, uh, where he uses Bhaktin's concept of dialogue to, you know, and, and not that Gandhi would have read Bhaktin, but, you know, so, but still, you know, I think this kind of thing, you know, Gandhi, so I think and all of us growing up in India without, without a smartphone, on the road, in the bus, in the university special, in, in the train, 
uh, would strike up conversations with people from of very different backgrounds from ourselves. So we didn't really need preaching. We didn't need, uh, you know, uh, to read Gandhi or to listen to Nehru's speeches or, uh, you know, scrutinize the constitution uh, to understand uh, how to respect difference, to understand difference, uh, to recognize that India was a land of many faiths, many languages, many cuisines, many forms of dress, and above all, many, many religious traditions. So I think I have a feeling that, uh, again, this is something, uh, uh, this is just an uh, instinctive feeling. It's a speculation. It's not uh, based on any serious research. But social media tends to put you in silos and tends to promote the us versus them kind of uh, uh, feelings, uh, frame of thinking. You may be right. Counterintuitive though it is. One would think it would widen one's world, but in fact, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, is there a way also that these, uh, these divisions that are now so familiar to us are in a sense, um, you know, intrinsic to Indian nationalism as such, to any nationalism. I'm thinking yeah, here, yeah. I just want to share with our, our viewers a vignette from your book, you know, in the, in the life, um, about the life of B.G. Horneman. And you describe how in 1926, you know, Horneman conducts a poll for the Indian National Herald uh, to choose, you know, the 10 greatest living Indians. Uh, winners include Gandhi, Tagore, Madan Mohan Malviya, amongst others. And you have this to say, uh, the 10 greatest Indians were all upper caste Hindus, of whom at least five were Brahmins. There was only one woman. There was no Muslim and no Christian, Sikh or Parsi either. In 1926. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Is it? Yeah, I mean, it is striking. Yeah, it is striking. I mean, sure. I mean, so maybe this has got a long history. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, it, of course, the, we've been talking, um, you know, about uh, your um, evocation of the past. Uh, you give us a very storied account of the India that was, but you do a couple of other things that few few writers do. Um, you give us an account of an India that may have been, you know, of its uh, potential history. Uh, one such uh, remarkable potential history is about the emergence and tenure of early communism in India. You know, yeah. and it's uh, through the biography of the redoubtable Philip Spratt, who's come up in our conversation, friend of M.N. Roy's, founder member of the Communist Party of India, lead accused in 1929 Meerut conspiracies case. As you tell his story, it's not it's not clear if I might use the this racing metaphor whether you have a horse in the race or not because you know and I was so reminded of it's always stayed with me. Um, it's a remarkable story, you know, critique of bourgeois democracy, proximity of the Russian Revolution. I was uh, struck of a, a sentence from your book of essays, Anthropologist Among Marxists, where you've written uh, inside every thinking Indian there is a Gandhian and a Marxist struggling for supremacy. So I could see that struggle in you as, as you were yeah. telling the story. So, of that. So I, yeah, thank you for that. In a sense, <laughs> I do have a horse in the race. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, at least in my case, I think um, uh, Gandhi wins and Marx loses. I mean, I still think Marx was a great thinker <laughs> and had some profound insights into modernity and uh, you know, the transformation of industrial society. But Marxists, I have less and less time for. And in some ways, I like Spratt because long before me, he, he was following the same kind of trajectory. So yes, I mean, yeah, I did have a horse. Yeah, I did have a horse in the race. And I, uh, I could I, I understand the appeal of communism shortly after the Russian Revolution. Uh, you know, uh, uh, to young Indians at that time, uh, including the great Bhagat Singh, you, you know, for example, you know, there was a new dawn. And Gandhi was seen as a slow moving, incremental, wishy washy, pussy footing kind of guy compared to what seemed to have been this dramatic total transformation that seemed to have taken place in Russia. I must have believed that if Bhagat Singh had lived 10 years, he may not have followed completely Spratt's trajectory, but he would have known more about what was happening in the Soviet Union. So, in that sense, I think Spratt, I was attracted to Spratt for many reasons. Uh, about not just because of my own uh, youthful um, uh, entanglement with the Marxism and communism when I was doing a PhD in Calcutta, but also because of his strong Bangalore connections. You know, I, I live in Bangalore and uh, 
uh, he's press the the weekly he edited in uh, bangalore called mice india for mice or india was printed in a press behind where i'm talking to you which is now a which is now a used car showroom by the way but that, that's a that's a side of our bangalore exchange he patronized a second hand bookstore called uh, select books which still exists uh, so i yes so he probably i had you know uh, i i don't know whether he went to koshi's cafe but very likely he did because it started in 1950 when he was still around here yeah. so i think sprat i mean i hesitate to name any of these seven people my favorite you know all i really enjoyed working with all of them but in some ways i think because of these personal resonances with kind of journeys i have taken and roads and you know uh, crossroads i have uh, encountered myself yeah so i'd say i think it's to think about sprat again talking about loyalty and friendship leader you know here is a man who as you say was the first accused in the merit conspiracy case yes and yes. Uh, then many years later joins raja ji in the swatantra party but after he dies his wife writes to his co conspirator in merit pc joshi who has still stayed a communist and says get my husband a freedom fighters pension i you mm -hmm. and pc joshi says i remember sprat very well i taught him hindi he introduced me to english literature he was always like a brother to me you are my bhabhi your sister in law and despite our later divergences in ideology he fought against the raj and i will do what i can to get you a freedom fighters widows pension which is actually what he does so you know sometimes this kind of friendship falls early on in the crucible of revolution uh you know uh, can withstand uh, later ideological differences it's a very moving story of how uh, the aging pc joshi gets prats widow of freedom fighters pension it's a remark she's a remarkable woman and yeah. the, the marriage itself is a it's a very real marriage uh yeah between yeah, very yeah. she's and i think alila you know one of my regrets um is not having access to her letters so yeah. So he was in jail. He would write to her once a week. Those letters are still in the possession of the family in Bangalore, which they very graciously shared with me. Uh, but her letters to him were probably burnt by the jail authorities after he had read them. Oh. But even from his letters to her, you get a sense of what a, a independent-minded and quite remarkable person she was. Yeah, yeah. Remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> uh... So, so Ram, apart from the story of kind of you know uh, uh, the Marxism uh, uh, that might have been, um, there's you also give us this much harder thing, you know, um, a history that could be, a history that could be, and a subjunctive history, um, and and this is invested so so surprisingly and wonderfully in the kind of radical ecologism uh, that you foreground in. A, surprising number of your subjects yes, i yes, mean yes. you know i'm so stuck i was so struck by this phrase from mira ben uh, she writes uh, that you cite the in the forests of the himalayas are the guardians of the northern plains which in their turn are the granary of india surely such guardians uh, deserve the utmost care now ram needless to say i mean your work on ecological consciousness has been path breaking and ahead of its time um I, I'd love to hear more about um, your own career-long attunement to uh, ecologism and how it's how it shapes your perspective. Even when you're writing about sports, uh, it's always there somehow. Uh, yeah. I suppose you know. I mean, the early engagement of a scholar never leaves the scholar. I'm sure you began life as a scholar of Shakespeare. You've done many different things. and you know wandered in many different directions since but i'm sure shakespeare has not left you and somewhere there's an imprint of your early training as a shakespeare scholar in whatever you write however remotely uh, however distant it may be in theme and subject from your early research and in that sense you know it's like your it's like your first love your first deep love is your phd thesis you know and yeah and i think my, my book the unquiet woods um, has obviously shaped the way i look at materials analyze it right but having said all of that uh, and moving the discussion away from my uh, uh, you know my career i when i wrote an environmental history of the himalaya uh, as uh, in the mid 80s i had no clue about mirabens work in the himalaya no clue i discovered it much later 
you know, uh, I came across a pile of her writings in the Hindustan Times, uh, really in the 1990s, after I had finished my research. And she was absolutely precocious, you know, her writings, of course, on forests, also on, on not just on what the destruction of forests would do to floods and increasing of floods, but also the composition of the forest, the, the transformation of oak to pine and the environmental impacts of that. And today I was sent in my inbox, two hours before our conversation, Leela, I was sent in my inbox the abstract of a paper by one of our very fine scientific ecologist, Ghazala Shabuddin. Um, and her work has been on declining bird diversity in the Himalaya because pine has replaced oak. Wow. <laughs> so, so I think Mila Ben was absolutely precocious. Her warnings against the excessive use of a chemical agri uh, fertilizer, her empathy for those displaced by large dams, which she talks to Nehru about. So Mira Sarla, who inspires the Chipko movement, really? and Keta in South India, who's yeah. kind of a, a proponent of appropriate technology. And, you know, uh, very much in the spirit of E.F. Schumacher's Small is Beautiful. So these three are really precocious ecologists. Mm. And uh, yes, I mean, I think they're going against the grain of Nehru's India, where it's all about large dams, steel mills, urban industrial concentrations, you know, a cult of big science, uh, which is kind of pervades the intellectual and policy making atmosphere. And in a sense, these three are rebels, having been rebels against the British Raj, they're now rebels against the kind of industrialized at all cost kind of thinking uh, that is so common in the 50s, and the 60s. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't, when I did my environmental research in the 80s and 90s, I had no clue about these pioneers. So I was in a kind, in a sense, I'm tracing a full circle and through their work coming back to my early interests. What, what led you? I mean, I know this is a side question, as they say, but I can't resist. What, what led you to this? Because it wasn't in vogue, you know, uh, but you were determined. It was just pure luck. It was pure luck. It was yeah. someone who told me. It was just complete luck. It was not, you know, it was just, uh, uh, I was in Calcutta. I'll tell you, uh, Lila, it was complete luck. <laughs> I was in Calcutta and the good fortune of meeting two or three remarkable older scholars. I was in Calcutta doing a PhD in sociology. I hadn't decided my research topic and a visiting scholar from Bangalore called Jayanta Bandopadi, I came and when I told him I was searching for a topic and he found out I was born and raised in Dehradun, he said, you know, the Chipko movement has taken place just there and only journalists have written about it and why don't you do a sociological study? And then, you know, since you're encouraging this kind of anecdote, anecdotage, I'll go on. Then I go to Delhi. And uh, I get, start go to the Delhi School Library, and I meet this extraordinary figure whom you may have encountered when you were uh, in Delhi, called Sri Vishwanathan. Of course. <laughs> and he says, "You're interested in ecology." He takes me to the Ratan Tata Library, and he takes out four books: Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, Barry Commoner's Closing Circle, and a, and a collection called Notes for the Future. And he says, "Read <laughs> this." I, think I take the three books to my books to my hostel room, and my mind opens. You know, so it's really these kinds of encounters. Then I go to, into the field and meet the Chipko leaders, particularly Chandi Prasad Bhatt, and I'm deeply moved by his courage, his sacrifice, his austerity, his commitment, his understanding, and his immersion in village social work, including with women. And uh, then the, it carries on from that. So it's really. Uh, the good fortune of having these encounters with people who oriented me in the right direction. Uh, that's wonderful, Ram. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, uh, how do you how do you write, Ram? I mean, uh, you know, this book as I, as I sat down to read it, I, I thought, uh, is it going to be seven short biographies? But oh no, it's nothing like that. It's a complex timeline. You have second innings and then you know a third part <laughs> the characters yeah. move in and out it's uh, i it was i couldn't i couldn't I, it was mesmerized by the structure of it there must have been so much information how do, how do you write so how do you write a book like this so this is again it was uh, a challenge because if you're writing a biography of one person hmm. uh, you know, it's a clear it's a clear narrative arc it's birth to death and the different episodes incidents you broadly uh, approach them and document them chronologically, not strictly, but broadly. Here there were seven lives and I didn't want seven discrete parts. I wanted to interweave them, you know, to show the ebb and flow and 
leave one person at a particular time, move on to the next, and then come back. And uh, inevitably, there was a cricketing metaphor, which you've noticed the second innings of the Oliver, because uh, the cricket is just one sport in which you get a second innings. Um, so, yes. So, and I, I, um, there, there was quite a lot more, and I, it was about 50,000 words longer. And a lot of it was really uh, quotations that said the same thing in different words in their voices. So with a good editor, I was able to cut all of that out. But I really enjoyed writing this book, Lila, because I think it was a, uh, you know, it was a return to my work on Elwin. Uh, you know, writing on Gandhi is a different kind of challenge. This oh. is in some ways more fun. This is in some ways more fun. More fun. You know, it's just, I mean, this is, this is Thumri compared to Khayal. You know, yeah. Yeah. You said too many compared to Drupal. So it's <laughs> more fun. More, more fun. Or it's like or they were saying Carnatic music to us. You see, different to us. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was, and I, I really enjoyed writing this book. I, I, I mean, the, uh, working on Gandhi was laborious. It was yeah, I yeah, I yeah, I yeah, yeah, I yeah, 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 uh, your go-to, you know, this is your night. What's on your nightstand, Ram Gopal? <laughs> well, I read lots of stuff, Lila. I read lots of stuff, uh, and it's. I don't have really. I think it's. I also said this in a recent conversation. Again, if there if there are some um, young scholars listening, I think it's important to have half a dozen or a dozen mentors and exemplars, not one, <laughs> not one. And that's true. That's true. Even uh, in your university. Yeah. Don't attach yourself too much to your dissertation supervisor. You'll become a pale shadow of that person, especially if they're as brilliant and charismatic as Dila Gandhi. You know, don't become don't become a chelik, a total chela of Dila Gandhi. Learn from <laughs> Dila Gandhi, but talk to other people in Brown as well. Right? No, so I don't say that. <laughs> so the, I always so I have you know I just read very widely, eclectically, Thank and you. learn and, and learn from all of them. Yeah, yeah. that's so. Uh... That's very good advice, Ram. You are absolutely right. Now, just one final uh, kind of literature wala question. That as I read these biographies uh, and their interweaving, I got such a, it was a kind of humanizing thing, such a wonderful sense of the variety in, in a lifespan. You know, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, uh, Annie Besson starting home rule at, in, at 60. So many of your characters, notably so many of the women, have yeah. this, this innings again at, in their yeah. 60s. Yeah. I, it was so heartening. Uh, I just would love to hear you just free associate about, you know, what life lessons you've learned as a biographer, because clearly <laughs> life starts again and again and again and again and again. Yeah, you know, I must say I'm daunted. I am soon to turn 64 or I'm tired. Really? You know, you know, I can't work, work, work hard anymore. And I think of these people. Meera uh, leaves uh, uh, India in 1959 when she's 67 and makes a new career in Austria, you know, listening to Beethoven, writing about Gandhi, writing an unreadable, unpublishable book <laughs> about Beethoven, which as an act of um, goodwill is published by Gandhians in Madurai of all places. <laughs> But she's obsessed by, it. you know, Sarla in her 70s is uh, uh, doing Bhutan work. Uh, Addie Besant is starting the Home Rule League. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, this capacity to uh, uh, go on and on and on, you know, I think it's they're very driven people and often driven by great idealism and the desire to, you know, uh, change things. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly am tired at 64. So I, I, I can write about them, but I can't remotely I mean, I'm, I'm in awe of what they're able to do at this age, yeah. But you talk about that, you chronicle the frailty of the body, you know, Salah Devi's body hurts, so uh, Mira's, Mira's body hurts, but then yeah. notwithstanding that, there is this, this second innings, you know, so. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Ram, I think uh, we are nearly at uh, 11. So I, it's just been so amazing to have this conversation. It's such a, a joy. Uh, I enjoyed it also so much, Leela. Thank you.
And so I think we'll uh, call Ashu and uh, start collecting questions. I'm sure Ashu himself uh, has yes. questions. Uh, Thank you. Ashu, Thank you. To... This was a, just to read out one comment that has come, which I think reflects my view as well. Here is Prerna Singh. What a mind-opening, heartwarming conversation. Thank you, Ram and Leela. That's, uh, I, I, I want to repeat that. Okay, um, I, I, the, the, the more questions coming in, I will, I, will, I will pick them up, but let me start with, with, with mine. Now, very striking thing in your description of Meera Ben is her attraction to Beethoven. Yeah. And uh, now you added something which I, I haven't been able to read uh, uh, very minutely. Maybe you did say somewhere in the book that as she returns to Austria, she becomes a, she writes a book on Beethoven. But what is, what it, this generates a curiosity of a, of a profound sort, I think, which is what explains, what would be the hypothesis for Mira Ben huge attraction to Beethoven and huge attraction to Mahatma Gandhi. What, uni so, what unites the two? Mm. Yeah, so I'll answer that. Uh, but first, just a footnote on her attraction to Beethoven. Yeah. It's itself an act of rebellion, Ashu and Leela, because mm. after the First World War, German music was anathema in England. Right. So for a British pianist to say, I will make a career playing Beethoven was not likely to win a, you know, uh, many, many fans. Now, ha, she, again, I talked about the accidents in my life. Mm -hmm. And all of us have accidents, happy accidents and uh, coincidences in each of our lives. And in Mira's case, because she admired Beethoven, she went to meet the French writer Romain Rolla, who was an expert on Beethoven, mm -hmm. and who had just published a biography of Beethoven. And while discussing that book with Romain Rolla, he told her, my next book is on Gandhi, and she had never heard of Gandhi. And then when that book was published, she picked it up, and transferred her allegiances almost overnight from uh, Beethoven to Gandhi. So it was really this meeting of Roma Rona that uh, right. occasioned this shift. Okay, and the, uh, here is another question. Um, so they're all attracted to Gandhi and they come and uh, live simple lives. In many cases, they give up on the luxuries they had. But even, even the simpler lives of the West would be, would be much more comfortable than the simple lives of India at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, um, it, 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 simply, uh, it seems to me, it, it's not just, uh, not just uh, Gandhi's life as depicted in Roman Rolla, um, which became a fascination for a lot of them. But there's also um, Gandhi's view about India as a nation, it seems to me, might be might play a role. So in Hind Swaraj, this is what Gandhi, remember that uh, as you know it better than most people, Hind Swaraj, but in this conversation, when he's asked, should the British be expelled from India after, after independence? And I, I cite, uh, he says, it is not necessary for us to have as our goal the expulsion of the English. If the English become Indianized, we can accommodate them. They just shouldn't be our rulers, right? So, yeah. so th there, is a, there is a view of na nationhood here, yeah. which is not ethnic, which yeah. is not religious, which is, which, which is a very capacious view of nationhood. India can, India can accommodate anyone who's Absolutely. willing to respect Indian culture um, and can come from anywhere. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, so that's, again, I'd like to uh, uh, suggest that it's very much there in Gandhi, and it's there in Gandhi's mentor, Gokhale, and it's also there in the only Indian Gandhi really recognized as his moral equal, who was Rabindranath Tagore. All of them had that sense that, you know, anyone who can come, identify with us, work with us, engage with us, and we will learn from them. Yeah. So, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, since it's not come up uh, so far in the conversation, I'd like to highlight for those who are part of uh, uh, the, the program today, that this book on foreigners who became Indians is dedicated to Jean Dres. Who, who is one himself. Who is one, he was a living example himself. He was a living example himself. And who's more Indian 
uh, in his understanding of how ordinary Indians live, mm. in his ability to converse in Hindi and Hindustani, in the arduous train and bus journeys he makes all over India than most of us. So, you know, he, he may have a white skin, but that's, that's completely accidental. Okay, so now some questions uh, from the chat room. Gautam Piduri uh, asked the following. Thanks so much for this conversation. I would like to ask about a perhaps counter ethos to what has been talked about so far. I think of a very different sort of Westerner, the esoteric Hindu Nazi, Julia Potes, who changed her name to Savitri Devi yeah. and was a virulent vegetarian ecologist anti-vivisectionist, but also a believer that Hitler was an avatar of Vishnu and that India could teach the world the best form of racial segregation via its caste system. Would it be fair to say that the self-transformation of the yogi might also go in the direction of fascism just as much it can go towards Gandhi? I, I certainly. I mean, people engage with countries in different ways. Absolutely. I mean, that can certainly happen. And uh, Savitri Devi is an example of someone who took a very different path. Uh, and in that sense, this, this returns us to Gandhi. It's Gandhi who enables this kind of constructive, empathetic, mutually beneficial engagement between the West and India. So yes, I absolutely, it, it can certainly go in a different direction. Would you, uh, just reminds me of one more thing. Would you, be, would you be able to say something about Aurobindo and Srima? Is there, is there something important to say there uh, as we talk about those who... I think I think Leela would be the best person to answer. I'd love to hear Leela's views on this. Okay, let's have Leela comment on that on that question. On 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 how how Ashu uh, would you uh, on Aurobindo and the mother, Aurobindo and the mother, and how that you know, uh, and of course, yeah. Well, you know, um, it, there are many ways of telling that story. Uh, mm. You know. Uh, and I think the story of Mira Alfasa is not as well known. It's uh, remarkable. It's complex. Uh, you know, it's because it's a story that comes from um, from France. You know, not from Britain. And those parts are less known in, in our historical imagination. I mean, she is a, a, a remarkable dissident, an intellectual dissident, a political dissident. I mean. When she comes to the Pondicherry ashram, there's nothing there. You know, uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo is described by uh, as the, you know, in Peter Hees's amazing uh, uh, biographies uh, of, of uh, Sri Aurobindo as the most dangerous man in India. He's run away from British India, uh, and this 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 person, this French Jewish Algerian um, uh, woman, uh, comes uh, um, to start uh, to join his ashram. They are also um, intellectually very interesting. They are collaborators. Um, you know, she gets um, citizenship in the 70s. It's a complex story uh, um, and really one that will require us uh, to, to look for material for outside of Britain, you know, interactions uh, from other parts. Uh, I could go on. Uh, mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite stories of the kind of theme that Ram is chronicling uh, in, in his book. Okay. Um, here is another question for you, Ram. This is about Sister Nivedita. Uh, I have found that you have mentioned Sister Nivedita among the honorary Westerners who played a part against the actions of both government and the Hindu dogmas. But according to you, why, why but, but she doesn't get a place in your book in yeah, detail. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I'm not disrespecting your view. I'm simply curious why she has disappeared from your, from your, uh, from your recent book. Yeah, so she's mentioned, again, you know, these are choices authors have to make to have a certain focus, a sharpness of, uh, uh, you know, so that it doesn't go all over the place. Mm. And the two I really regret leaving out to Sister Nivedita and Charlie Andrews. Mm. Uh, uh, Charlie Andrews is a particular favorite of mine uh, because he was so close to Tagore and to Gandhi and was an extraordinary figure. I mean, the work he did for uh, uh, the emancipation of indentured labor in places like Guyana and Fiji and so on. Uh, inspired by Gandhi was quite extraordinary. Uh, so, but eventually I decided only to include uh, those people who had been arrested or deported. But to your questioner about Sister Nivedita, I've now uh, begun some work returning to my early environmental interests where she figures uh, in a very interesting way. Uh, there was a, 
Some of you might know of a Scottish town planner called Patrick Geddes, who, was an ecolo who had an ecological approach to the city and who wanted to blend the city and the countryside, really, in redesigning settlements. And he was inspired by Sister Nivedita to come to India, where he wrote many forgotten town plans, which I hope to write about now. So people like Sister Nivedita, um, Mira Alfalsa, you know, and others inspired many, many, many interesting lines of thought and argument. But I really felt she didn't have a place in this book. Another person I was sorry to leave out was Margaret Cousins, who started the All India Women's Conference. You know, uh, and I had to leave her out too. You know, uh, so I think one has to make choices of that kind, and which is not to say other people shouldn't flesh out their lives and their and their legacies in richer detail. I mean, think about uh, every work of history is that it's incomplete interim with it's it's an invitation to an argument yeah you know hopefully to a constructive argument which leads to further and deeper scholarship so yeah, so, yeah. you you say that uh, you didn't include charlie andrew was he didn't didn't go to jail sister yeah. nivedita she, did, well, did, she didn't she didn't go to jail no, she didn't go to jail so that's another reason you could yeah, another that's reason that's you, that's you that's could that's you could leave her out of the domain of analysis exactly yeah right okay now um neelam shrivastav Thank you for this fantastic conversation, Professor Guha. I was wondering if you felt there were analogies between the figures you explore in your book and other anti-colonial activists uh, in, in later and geographically diverse contexts. Yes. I'm struck by Professor Leela Gandhi's use of the term self-othering, self-othering in relationship to metropolitan sympathizers with anti-imperialist movements. In particular, I was then thinking of Franz Fanon, who dies in Algerian, and Sylvia Pankrist, who dies in Ethiopia, having defended Ethiopia against the Italian invasion in 1935. Do you have some thoughts on Fanon yes. uh, and, and Pankrist? Yes, they certainly be part of this constellation. I actually make a comparison in my book, uh, in the epilogue, where, mm -hmm. I, uh, where, I, uh, where I compare the Westerners who joined the Indian freedom struggle with white South Africans who rebelled against apartheid, who betrayed their race in a similar way, you know, uh, renegades, dissenters, rather than benefit from uh, the racial system, uh, which as privileged whites, you know, they could be part of and enjoy. People like Joe Slobo, Ruth First, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Nadine Gardema like too, the novelist. Huh? Nadine, Nadine Gardema, the novelist. Nadine Gardema was more a bridge builder than yeah. a renegade, but she was more a bridge. But okay. how that too? They were bridge builders and they were rebels and renegades. Mm. So I think they are a really interesting group of people. You know, I think um, Alby Sachs, who lost an arm, uh, who was there in a bomb blast, and then went on to be a member of the South African Constitutional Court after after mm. Mandela became president. I think they're an extraordinary group. Also, uh, maybe uh, again, this is they are briefly mentioned in my book. Uh, the Lincoln Brigade of Americans who fought in the Spanish Civil War on, on the side of the Republicans. Sylvia Pankhurst, for sure. Franz Fanon, absolutely. You know, all these people uh, are part of the same, uh, you could say, biradiri, you know, if I may use that term, mm -hmm. the same biradiri as, as the rebels of my book. Yeah. Uh, the Pren same yeah. Pren Singh okay. is very struck by your dedication to John Drez. And, uh, he, and she says, perhaps we can visualize him as a rebel against the Hindu nationalist Raj. That might be an interesting. If someone wrote a biography yeah. of Jean, Jean, yeah. then yeah. perhaps yeah. that would be the title, A Rebel Against Hindu Nationalist Raj. Yes, probably, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. But she says, I had a question about the counterfactuals or potential histories, the term that you've used. Looking at the present, it's notable that in the list, uh, looking at the present in particular, it's notable in the list of the top 10 Indians uh, that you mentioned in the 1920s, there is Madan Mohan Malviya. Yeah. Um, uh, and there's also a Gandhian and a Marxist there. Um, is, is Malviya recognized as a Hindu nationalist at that time or not? Yeah, sort of, sort of. I mean, this is a time when you could be both a member of the Hindu Mahasabha and the Congress. So mm. he is recognized as a, as a Hindu nationalist. I think he's, he's admired then for having uh, founded the Baranis Hindu University and for his scholarship. I think that's really, he's a, he's an Acharya. You know, he's really, that's how he's, how he's seen. He's seen as a teacher, yeah, you know, uh, and uh, that's how he's admired, yeah. One thing, if I may say about John Dres, mm -hmm. and if I make a, may make a, uh, 
a revelation, not a confession. Mm -hmm. This book, uh, uh, Leela and Ashu, was originally titled Renegades. I see. So it carried the title Renegades for the last 15 years. Uh -huh. And um, so it was called Renegades. The subtitle is the same, Western Fighters for India's Freedom. Mm -hmm. And the dedication read, for Jean Drez, a renegade of our time. Okay, <laughs> now that, now, however, however, six months ago, Barack Obama and Bruce Springsteen decided to publish a book with the title Renegades. Yes. So I, had to look, I, I was not going to compete with them. So I had to look for another title. So it became Rebels Against the Rights, which was fine, which was evocative enough and descriptive, ac an accurate description of what the book is about. But I was sorry to change uh, the dedication because I couldn't say a rebel of our time, but a renegade of our time would have made more sense. Yes, I think Shaw will hopefully get his own biography one day soon. You know, uh, yeah. uh, I don't know how cooperative he'll be. Yeah, he's a very, as you know, very elusive, reclusive uh, kind of chap. I mean, if I may use an idiom from your native uh, land, Ashu, what a thoda sanki admi hai. You know, he, he's very admirable, but also a bit odd. You know. So, right. Yeah. Okay, so here is another question. This is from uh, Arkabrata Bera. Um, I'm not sure where, I, I, maybe India, maybe America, uh, maybe, maybe further beyond. Most of the time, we find that the Westerners who were involved in the, move, in the movement against caste were of course drawn to Gandhi or passive in nature. I think the idea here is passivity. I mean, passivity, uh, of course, Gandhi resisted the term passive, at least in, in, in his later years. Yes. Do we find Westerners who were part of a more aggressive movement in India or believed in violent overthrow of the British? Uh, not to back? my knowledge, hmm? not to my knowledge, but uh... I uh, I haven't come across them, but it's possible. I mean, I don't know of any, any Westerners who, I mean, they were, the odd, of course, the communists, yes. I mean, Philip Spratt, and along with Philip Spratt, there were two other communists in the Merit Conspiracy, in, British communists in the Merit Conspiracy case called mm -hmm. Bradley and Hutchinson, uh, if memory serves. And they clearly believed in violent revolution, uh, but uh, they would have been very few, really. Yeah. But, um, and Bhagat Singh obviously is not a source of attraction at the time because he's very, he's very young and he's, he's very young. Yeah. And he's silly, yeah. when, he, when he's executed, how old was he? He was 23, 23 years old. So he still had, had, to, had to get a following. I mean, he, yeah. he became larger than life after his execution. Absolutely. Right? And with mm -hmm. every succeeding year after his death, you know, he's more and more important. And now he's an iconic figure for Madhmi Party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the two the two portraits that that the chief, uh, Aam Aadmi Party chief minister in Punjab has in his office are Ambedkar and Bhagat Singh. Very interesting combination. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Those are the um, okay. So um, here is Mohan uh, Manan Bhatt. Um, what parallels and or contradictions you would draw between Swami Vivekanandan and M.K. Gandhi, who play such, both of whom play such important roles for, for you, and in particular, about their views of women? Ah, that's a very large and complicated question, and I haven't studied it uh, seriously enough to answer. You know, and I'm not really a Vivekananda scholar. I should say that I, of course, know a little bit about him, and I'm intrigued and admired some of, much of what he's done, but I haven't really studied him in any depth, so I can't really answer that. Uh, was there anything Vivekananda said about Gandhi? Well, he died before Gandhi became prominent, right? Yeah, and Gandhi goes to Belur but doesn't meet him. He goes there but doesn't meet him. Interestingly, uh, these are the very interesting aspects of, uh, uh, of um, you know, uh, these lives. There's no reason for Vivekananda to know of Gandhi because Vivekananda died, I think, in 1901. And yes. Gandhi was just a minor activist in South Africa at that time. Right. But Vivekananda and Tagore, Mm -hmm. lived in the same town. Mm -hmm. Both were very influential. Tagore by the 1890s was already a major, major Bengali writer. Right. But they really were ships that passed each other in the night mm -hmm. and they never referred to one another. Mm -hmm. And uh, they only meet once uh, in the home of the American Consul General in, in Calcutta. You know, that's very interesting. But mm -hmm. there is an interesting Gandhi-Vivekananda connection which Leela would also be particularly interested in, which I would briefly mention. Yeah. You know, in my biography, I talk about Gandhi's enchantment with Sarla Devi Chaudhrani, 
who was Tagore's niece, who was a great writer, singer, patriot, whom Gandhi was very really besotted with for, mm. uh, for about a couple of years. Mm. And she uh, uh, was close to Vivekananda. She was an extraordinary Indian woman. She deserves a biography of her own. You know, mm. she left home. She decided to study science, which no uh, woman had done in Calcutta before then. She goes to Mysore to become a teacher because she doesn't want to arrange marriage. Then she encounters Vivekananda, and Vivekananda is so struck by her. Vivekananda mm. cooks for her. Vivekananda was, by the way, a great cook who mm. loved cooking non-vegetarian food. Let this be said, loud and clear and, and underlined. Vivekananda was a great non-vegetarian cook. And I wish he was here in Karnataka today with an open kitchen to which all of us could go. You know? So and <laughs> in one of those meals which he cooked for Sarla Devi, he told her, you're so brilliant, you're so beautiful, you're so charismatic, you're a singer, you're a poet. You should preach Hindu Dharma all over the world. I'll send you as my emissary, right? And this is the same woman whom Gandhi was enchanted by 20 years later. So there's an interesting kind of Vivekananda Gandhi connection there, but it's mostly anecdotal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Arka, Arka, Arka Beda again, and he adds here now, by the way, I'm from India. So uh, and that's where he's writing from. That's, that's where he's joined the conversation here. Um, he basically wants to know why um, you've written about so many people here as well as earlier. Why have you never written about revolutionaries? But the other people to write about revolutionaries. <laughs> and I'm not a revolutionary. I'm not a revolutionary myself. I believe in reform and incremental change. I'm not a revolutionary. So uh, I, I can see what inspires people to become revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. But as a historian of the 20th century, uh, I've seen where revolutions have taken societies, and you know, I so at the, see, not, I think there are may a thousand hundred <coughs> for, you know flowers bloom, and other people can write about. I'm not attracted by revolutionaries. I think Bhagat Singh was an extraordinary figure. I think because I've read his diaries, mm -hmm. and I think he was a very a man of a wide and capacious interests, and. Lenin, uh, Marxist Leninist dogma, he would not have been confined by it had he lived another five more years. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was reading all kinds of things. He was reading Adam Smith, he was reading Tolstoy. God knows where he would have gone. Uh, but revolutionaries generally don't attract me. They don't attract you. Okay, so why would you write about them? Yeah. When uh, Richard uh, Attenborough was asked, Richard Attenborough was asked by General Zia, now that you made a film on Gandhi, can you make a film on Jinnah? And uh, he said, no, I'm not attracted to Jinnah. Therefore, I cannot make a film on him. And isn't my view of Jinnah very clear from my, my work, uh, my film Gandhi? So let me, say, let me say that my view of revolutionaries is not as pejorative as Attenborough's view of Gandhi. Okay. <laughs> of Jinnah, of Jinnah. I don't, I don't have that view, but if they're not for me. I, I don't really uh, have that. Yeah. Uh, we have eight more minutes, and I'm sure there will be more questions. Yeah, there are more questions coming, but there is the uh, two, three questions here, which, which I was also going to ask. So you have uh, how many women here? You have uh, three, three out of seven. Three, 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 three. three out of seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Gandhi's views about women. Hmm. Uh, I was very struck when I read Gandhi, my mother, by the nie the niece who went to yeah, yeah, Noah yeah. Khali with Ma them. Manu, Manu Gandhi, Manu Gandhi. Yeah, Manu, yeah. Gandhi, my mother, the idea that, that, that she was conceptualizing. And then Gandhi, uh, Suzanne Rudolph writing somewhere that at one point towards the last three, four years of his life, uh, he says, I have played so many roles in life. I have never played the mother. And uh, it would be nice to, nice to have, uh, uh, nice to nice to be able to play this role, and then I soon after that I read uh, Manu's uh, M Gandhi, my mother. Now, um, can you say something about what his views about women have to do with, with whether these three women were attracted to him, 
or or generally i think you're right to say that at one level gandhi is a is an arch feminist there is no doubt about that that argument i think you're right he brought out uh, women into the public sphere and especially during the second the sol satyagraha i think it's very clear that the uh, the idea the, the brilliant truly a, a, a brilliant idea of salt was also addressed to those who cook in the kitchen uh, why are you paying so much for your salt you know and this is uh, i call it in my class the, uh, the, the 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 tea party moment in some ways uh, yeah, there, yeah. there is a, something very remarkably indigenous and remember he um, he um, um, he when he goes to the congress party that i want to start a salt satyagraha nehru writes he got a provisional agreement a provisional approval because they said gandhi knows something that we don't we don't understand the salt business but he understands something we don't and lo and behold within 3 months all of india was making salt so yeah. so it was quite a, anyway now let's return to women so salt march did bring out women into the public sphere so in that sense gandhi is a feminist but feminism is not only about bringing women into the public sphere right so how are it can what can you say about his view of women and yeah. these three women that you've chosen their attraction to him <clears throat> so before the salt march mm -hmm. uh several years there was a salt march because of gandhi sarojini naidu becomes the first indian woman to be president of the congress annie besant had been president in 1917 and gandhi insists that sarojini naidu is made president in 1925 at a time when i very much doubt that providence rhode island had any women in any city council or democratic or republican uh, councils at all right so right. he was cognizant of that uh, at the same time as i've said in my conversation with lila uh, you know there were limitations to what kind of independence and agency he would give women he was ambivalent about women working in the workforce his views on celibacy are usually problematic for men and for women but i think he it is deeply conservative high bound traditional society he brought women into public life and they went on into different kinds of things you know um people like um, nidula sarabhai subhadra joshi aruna asif ali and above all my favorite indian woman kamla devi chattopadhyay uh, there's a great biography that has just been written and i have i'm privileged to get an early copy of the manuscript it won't be out for a year or a year and a half by the wonderful young um, American historian Nico Slate. Hmm. It's of the first high-class biography of Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay, and she is comes from the Gandhi Gharana, and she does many things. I mean, she is famous for having revived handicrafts, for hmm. having set up the Sangeet Natak Academy, but hmm. also as Nico Slate shows, she carries the Gandhian message of Satyagraha to the American South in the late thirties, long before Martin Luther King. So, hmm. from the Gandhi Gharana. All kinds of women come. I mean, Ella Bhatt is also from the Gandhi Gharana. You I know, she is she's from Ahmedabad and uh, knows about Gandhi, uh, and then of course rebels against the male domination of the Gandhian Labour Union and mm. starts her own uh, self-employed women's association. So, in that sense, despite what may appear to be his own occasionally or more than occasionally conservative views about women, he is an enabler of uh, women's emancipation. to the lives of people like kamla devi and ila bhatt and uh, and sarla ben and meera ben and many many others and he doesn't see that as a contradiction you see in a conservative society you have to go slowly for example for the first time in I mean, imagine in india men and women in the 1920s you know on the street on the same ashram on the same school it's an incredibly radical act of transgression so you yeah. have to put boundaries even his celibacy and his insistence on brahmacharya is partly because of that that he doesn't want to scare the parents who are spending sending their boys and girls out to join the movement but i think he is always ambivalent about women working in fact raja ji also shares that i think nehru and ambedkar are more thorough going feminists than people like gandhi and rajya gopal acharya and what is because what is the objection to women working or ambivalence just, what is the what is the opposition yeah. essentially he thinks the major role of a woman is in the household. And household family and household yeah raising children yeah and running the household and running carrying home. carrying forth the uh, home yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, just as kasturva did yes and maybe of course you not as loyally and submissively as kasturva did but mm -hmm. generally yes yeah Let me see if there are any other questions. I thought uh, Arvind was also online. Arvind Subramanian. 
May I, Arvind, do you have a question? Oh, Arvind has a question. Uh, no, Arvind has a comment. Wonderful event, Ram, Leela, Ashru, thank you. Okay. Um, and another question, when will it be uploaded on YouTube? Very soon, uh, those who want to watch this on YouTube, it, the, uh, it, was, it was streamed live and we will put it up uh, on our Watson Institute uh, YouTube channel um, uh, before long, not before long, very, very soon. So um, it's time now for me as a host to thank uh, Ram for, uh, and Leela for this conversation and Ram especially for giving us yet another book in his untiring journey of um, as a as a writer i'm sure there's another coming another book coming very soon uh, uh, this 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 you said this was born some 25 30 years ago the 20, idea 20 or 20 odd years ago yeah, yeah so you've been you've been collect you've been but you, yeah. most of the writing was done no no i the writing was done in the last two years but in these 20 years when i was working on gandhi and yeah. indian history i would just collect stuff i found in the archives related to it and okay. file it away yeah. all right um Thank you very much, Ram, thank you, for joining, joining us at Brown, and thank you, Leela, for, for leading this conversation. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye, everyone.